Well, thank you very much and um, good morning or good afternoon, depending on uh, your cultural background. Um, I understand around this time you had lunch yesterday, so I apologize for keeping you away from, from lunch. Um, my objective is to make a um, modest contribution to what I think is quite a, a sophisticated technical conference, um, a modest contribution from uh, the perspective of the high-level regulator, which we are at um, European level. So, my name is, uh, is Philip Cornelis, and um, as was mentioned in the introduction, I'm the head of unit uh, of uh, a unit that is responsible for safety uh, and environmental regulation in the European Commission's Directorate for uh, Aviation Affairs. Um, and I have been in this job for uh, almost a year, so still quite a, a newcomer. Um, I will try to um, highlight the overall framework uh, of the decision-making uh, at EU level and the value added which uh, we believe we can bring to the whole uh, noise file. Well, I don't need to mention this to you. Noise is a uh, societal problem um, and is uh, therefore also a political issue that arises at all levels of uh, governance, uh, mostly, of course, at the local level, but we are not completely isolated and also at uh, European level there is a uh, call for action on um, the question of noise. In Europe, um, many people, because of the uh, density of uh, population in Europe, many people are affected by noise that distinguishes us from other regions in the world. Um, there is a, another uh, fact that we have to take into account is the demonstrated link between uh, noise and health, and there is also a health policy at uh, European level when um, uh, transnational issues are at stake, such as aviation, that is by definition international uh, activity. And uh, we see uh, as an illustration of the importance of uh, societal aspects um, that uh, the uh, uh, quite drastic decision has been taken here at this airport um, to close at night. Uh, it's just an illustration of the importance of, of the issue. Um, as a background, uh, we also, of course, have to take into account the interdependencies between noise issues and uh, other policy areas, other environmental issues, such as uh, emissions, uh, CO2 and local emissions, and of course our responsibility to promote the development of aviation in general, so uh, uh, the capacity of uh, airports uh, and of the uh, aviation network is of course also uh, an objective that we have to take into account. Uh, we are, of course, less uh, exposed to local action from uh, communities living in neighborhoods of airports, but uh, as I said, we are not uh, isolated. Um, and to give you two examples uh, of who is knocking at our door, well, first of all, of course, the aviation industry, the um, air carriers, because um, they are concerned that we should have as much as possible a level, level playing field uh, in Europe so that they can uh, operate under clear rules and, and rules that are fair uh, for everybody, wherever their hub uh, and main base of operations is. And secondly, we are always under pressure from uh, third countries, um, not to mention the US in particular, of course, because they have the biggest traffic. Um, uh, and basically at every meeting we have with the US, uh, and we have quite often meetings, they bring up noise issues. Uh, often they bring up specific measures that have been taken at one or the other airport uh, and put into question the process uh, that has led to those decisions. Our noise policy is part of a comprehensive approach to the environmental impact uh, of aviation. And uh, what I will try to do is, uh, is to, uh, I will mention operating restrictions at the end of my presentation, but also try to give the, the wider picture uh, within which we work. Um, at EU level, we are active uh, in a number of areas, uh, starting with research and development. There are EU funds uh, devoted to um, activities that contribute to noise abatement. There's the Clean Sky. Um, joint uh, Technology Initiative, there is the CESAR Joint Undertaking uh, in the area of ATM, uh, and there is research into alternative fuels. We are active in uh, standard setting at the European level, but mostly also at global level within ICAO. 
including noise standards and uh, emissions. Uh, we are active in the field of operational measures within the single sky, uh, working on uh, modernization of ATM rules based on performance targets, as you are all well aware. And, uh, for example, uh, issues such as introducing continuous descent approaches. And finally, uh, we are active in the field of regulation and market-based measures. As you know, we favor in general uh, market-based approaches. Uh, that's the, the, the road that has been taken for uh, CO2. Of course, they're also allowed in the area of noise to internalize environmental effects in charges, for example. But in noise, uh, we also have rules on operating restrictions. And I will, of course, come back to those. We work within the framework of the famous ICAO balanced approach. So what do we do as EU within this, um, within this framework? Well, first of all, of course, we work at uh, limiting noise at source, um, working on global standards through ICAO. And we have our uh, directives um, on uh, operating restrictions. There is the issue of land use, which of course is a uh, local responsibility, but uh, it's an important component of the balanced approach, and it's something that we should not um, um, lose from sight. Um, there is the issue of uh, aircraft trajectories and procedures, which I think was the focus of the preceding uh, presentation, and here uh, our objective is certainly through the uh, ATM policy and, and CESAR to uh, give as much support to the development of such um, operational solutions as possible. And finally, there is the uh, regulations or uh, the current directive on operating restrictions and our current proposal for a new regulation in this area. The, the most important um, principle that uh, I should mention in the context of our uh, activity on the balanced approach is that um, the, is the principle of subsidiarity. Um, what we do in general is to focus on setting the framework, and this is very much the case in the noise area. We do not take decisions um, or intervene in individual cases. But at the same time, of course, it is true that uh, local decisions affect global business, affect the European uh, network, uh, and therefore it's necessary to have a, a partnership to take into account all the interests, including, uh, uh, first of all, the local interests, but also the more global interests. And that's why um, there needs to be an interaction between different government, government levels, the local level, regional, national, European, uh, and international, uh, global, to uh, make sure that we take the most cost-effective solutions. So let me go through the, the four areas uh, that I mentioned earlier, the standards, the land use, the operational procedures, and the uh, restrictions. First of all, quieter aircraft. We are um, pushing consistently for high ICAO standards for noise at source. We are probably the region pushing hardest because, um, because we are the, that um, highly built up and densely populated area. Um, and, um, but of course, it's not so easy at the global level. We have to work um, basically on the basis of consensus with other states and regions who do not feel this problem so acutely. Uh, but nevertheless, um, we have managed uh, also recently to put in place a new ICAO standard that is not just backstopping, but actually drives uh, the technology forward and gives incentives both to manufacturers and to um, uh, air carriers to uh, invest in uh, improved technologies. The international standards that are agreed in ICAO are uh, transposed into European law via the uh, certification uh, criteria that uh, EASA uses to uh, certify aircraft. And secondly, of course, we base ourselves on the IKEA standards to completely uh, prohibit uh, obsolete aircraft. The way we do this uh, at ICAO level is, is uh, somewhat complicated. Uh, the EU is not as such a member of ICAO. We have an observer status, and the members are the EU member states. 
Um, and uh, some of the member states are scaling back their involvement in such uh, 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 specialized areas as uh, noise abatement. And therefore, we rely more and more on, on good cooperation, coordination, and pooling the best uh, resources that exist uh, in the member states and, and in EASA, for example, or Eurocontrol, to try to come uh, with a, a common European position. Usually, that works. Um, we usually manage to extend it to the neighboring countries, um, and we uh, typically take positions in ICAO with, uh, in a block of 44 countries. So that's quite uh, a heavy um, influence in uh, ICAO. The second point, uh, land use, uh, can be quite short because we have no competence at EU level for good reasons, and we have no ambition in this area. Uh, this should be uh, decided at local level, but uh, it's important that also local decision making um, um, is, takes into account the role uh, within the balanced approach, takes into account the long-term consequences of uh, decisions. Thirdly, the question of uh, operational procedures. Environmental performance is, of course, part of the single sky policy. Uh, and covers both the en route uh, and the um, local phases of uh, operations. Um, and uh, we set the general framework. There should be targets, uh, in uh, different kinds of targets that need to be applied to the best of uh, ability, uh, taking into account local circumstances. So there's, of course, a role uh, for the uh, national civil aviation authority and the operators themselves to actually decide how concretely to put in place those targets. And finally, the uh, operating restrictions. We um, aim for um, cost-effective measures. Operating restrictions are, of course, the most sensitive issue, um, not least here in Frankfurt. Um, but what is important for us here is subsidiarity, and all we do is regulating the process. We don't decide the actual measures. We impose a process, a due process that has to be followed um, to make sure that the decisions are taken not only on the basis of who is making the most noise or who is the most effective lobbyist, but that the decisions are based on, on consultation, discussion, on, and on transparency uh, in terms of what the actual impacts are, that it's a discussion based on evidence. Um, and uh, we are convinced uh, that this leads to more, um, uh, to better solutions um, and more acceptance from all sides uh, that compromises have to be made. We provide support for such a process, a uh, collaborative process, by providing a method, by providing data uh, to carry out the uh, evidence um, gathering and uh, modeling. Secondly, um, there is the um, policy on marginally compliant aircraft that is an important component of the EU regulation. Again, not imposing anything uh, in terms of measures, but giving a tool as part of the whole toolbox that is available to uh, local authorities and, um, and operators. Uh, it's a tool to uh, use this option to impose restrictions or not, depending on whether uh, locally other options are better or not. And we have, of course, a common definition of what are marginally compliant aircraft that helps to avoid uh, discussions and disputes um, that there, uh, uh, this discrimination or, or locally uh, unfair decisions uh, are taken. And at the same time, of course, by making this optional, uh, we allow uh, for air traffic growth where um, this is needed. Some figures to illustrate this issue. Uh, because it's quite, uh, it's one of the few remaining points of discussion between the European Parliament and the Council uh, on our new regulation uh, is precisely the, the level uh, of uh, marginal, uh, marginal compliance and the timing of, uh, of the different levels. So um, in these um, figures you see uh, in the third column the um, current definition of marginally compliant airports is applied to a number of, um, uh, sorry, aircraft is applied to a number of airports. And you see that uh, in 2006, because this one is 2006, 
um, there was uh, around 2% uh, of uh, aircraft affected by this uh, or fell into this uh, category uh, of marginally compliant. Um, chapter 3 minus 8 uh, is what Council and European Parliament would like to put in the new regulation. Um, and then you see what this would have meant in 2006. Uh, and the Commission proposal was chapter 3 uh, minus 10, uh, which covers a, a larger uh, um, a larger share of uh, operations. But it's important now to look at the picture in 2011. And uh, there you see that, in fact, the current definition of marginally compliant aircraft is, has become almost meaningless. There are almost no um, operations anymore within this category. So as a tool that we provide to uh, local authorities, it's, it's, it's no longer useful. That's why we definitely need to modify this uh, definition. Um, we are not very happy with the uh, European Parliament and Council's position to, um, to limit the uh, new definition to chapter 3 minus 8, because as you see here, even in 2011, which is already two years ago, it also affected a very, very small, about half a percent uh, of operations, whereas uh, chapter 3 minus 10 is uh, covering uh, between, let's say, 5 and 10 percent and giving, therefore, uh, making this a useful measure for those who want to make use of it. Um, the two figures in bold are the two cases where, in fact, the uh, market evolution has been um, uh, unhelpful because the number of uh, operations falling within this uh, category has actually increased since 2006. So uh, these are really the, the cases where uh, the use of the marginally compliant aircraft uh, tool would, would bite the most, whereas you see that in other cases um, the airports um, and the carriers have managed to improve a lot. If you take the first two cases, Amsterdam and Charles de Gaulle, uh, in 2000, if I can go back, I'm not sure, yes, in 2006 uh, you had 7% um, uh, and 9% falling uh, in the category, and uh, now they are both just over 4%. So there actually uh, the market has evolved uh, itself. The main elements of our new proposal, which is um, close to being uh, finalized with Council and European Parliament, are, uh, first of all, that we replace the directive with a regulation. This means that uh, the rules are directly applicable. Member states do not have to uh, adopt their own national law uh, implementing the European rules, uh, but the rules, the method, the process that we prescribe is directly applicable and therefore is much more harmonized, much less uh, confusion. Um, uh, and secondly, uh, we uh, harmonize the methods uh, to decide on operating restrictions. We don't impose solutions. They remain tailored to the local situation, to the airports. We impose, uh, we propose to impose a common noise measurement method and the use of common data and there will be support available from a European database of uh, noise certification of aircraft. Um, and we will also uh, be able to make available modeling software. Uh, we impose that there should be a technical group that involves all the stakeholders locally, the airports, airlines, ANSPs, and the uh, community living in the area. Uh, and this is one of the most um, important uh, forms of aligning the policy with the environmental noise directive that also puts a lot of emphasis on, on consultation, transparency, and discussion. And finally, there's a fifth pillar uh, to the balanced approach, which is not part of the official balanced approach, but nevertheless a major contributing factor to success. And this is, as I mentioned before, the importance of engaging with the community. Um, it's a concept well known to the Environmental Noise Directive, which, as you know, is covering all forms of industry and transport, not, not only aviation, but includes aviation. Uh, and this concept, uh, the importance given to um, uh, transparency and cooperation um, is, is also going to be introduced in our regulation. 
because there is uh, evidence that uh, good neighborhoodly relations actually uh, promotes good solutions or better solutions for everybody and greater acceptance of the fact that there is a, f a degree of uh, uh, noise and uh, environmental nuisance. So what will contribute to this uh, in our proposal is first of all the need for having a technical group. Um, the fact that there will be a, a more evidence-based process with data and models available to everybody involved. Um, and uh, finally, that it will be possible to disseminate best practices such as uh, access to the community to aircraft uh, movements data. So finally, um, to sum up the main elements, um, it's clear that airports will not move. Uh, position. We have to reconcile the quality of life with the freedom to fly. Um, at EU level, we set very general rules, but we are able to uh, bring together all those uh, policy objectives. We set a framework, we set uh, process, rules on process and methods, but we don't decide concrete measures. Um, and we hope that our uh, regulation contributes to evidence-based policy making. We feel it's important, and we try to promote this through our regulation, that um, the whole toolbox of uh, measures should be always kept in mind. We should not rely only on one tool, such as operating restrictions, but lose, use all uh, elements in the toolbox, including short-term measures, but also long-term measures, such as land use planning, um, in order to get the best mix between measures that is the most uh, cost-effective. Thank you very much for your presentation. We here for some questions. Yes. There might be some questions or comments. Over there in more or less the last row, Mr. Meisinger. Is there a microphone over there? Yes, it comes. I have a small bunch of questions. The closure of Frankfurt at night, you had in one of your slides, and you called that dramatic. I'd say it's visionary. Uh, you said night. It's not the night. It's from 11 to 5. So uh, you should really change that slide. It's wrong. Um, cost effectiveness. What about health and uh, health questions? The costs of health. Why is cost effectiveness so? high on the agenda of the EU, and why is harmonization so high on the agenda? We have heard in former um, talks that we should have different systems working from airport to airport or from runway to runway. So what, what, what is the gain that you are only talking about harmonization? And the last point, airports will not move. That is not true. Uh, in Munich, we had a major movement of a very important airport. Mm -hmm. Okay. I knew it was going to be dangerous to mention that uh, uh, night uh, issue in Frankfurt. Um, but it, it illustrates the, the general point that I wanted to make, which is that, uh, that we don't impose solutions. We, have, we, we had no role in, in that measure at all at European level. Uh, it's a local decision. Uh, and what we try to do is to uh, set in terms of harmonization, because you asked the question, why harmonization? We harmonize the method, we harmonize um, the process, uh, but we leave the decisions at the end of the day in the hands of, of local authorities. Um, why are we involved? Because uh, noise is, a, is, a, is, is first of all a local issue, but it has a, a much wider dimension. And, um, all users of, of airspace and airports um, are entitled, including passengers, by the way, uh, to a, a good policy in this area, and one that uh, takes into account all the impacts uh, in a balanced way on the basis of, of evidence. Um, and it's up to the local authorities to set the level of ambition. If I want to be very strict in my uh, region, you can. There's nothing that prevents you. Uh, but then when, as, as to which measures are chosen to uh, achieve those objectives, uh, it's important that a certain process is followed, that the whole toolbox is taken into account. This is the contribution that we try to make. But as I said, the ambition 
Uh, the policy ambition is a purely local decision. There's no harmonization uh, whatsoever. Further questions or comments? That is not, there is one, okay. Over there, please, microphone comes. Yes, hello, my name is Gilbert Koskla, coming from the city of Vantau, where the Helsinki airport is located. I was interested in about that technical group of airport. Where is it coming from? Do you have any regulation or will there be, will there be any regulation of that? Or what is the idea for that technical group of airport? Well, if I'm well informed, there is already in the environmental noise directive, which, as I said, covers uh, all forms of industry and, and transport, including aviation, a requirement for such a consultative body. Uh, and for example, to review every five years with that community the situation. So what we try to do in the new regulation, which is not yet adopted, but which is in the final stages of negotiation between the European Parliament and the Council, and which could be adopted later, uh, not this year, but in, the, in 2014. What we try to do there is to, is to align the, the process, so uh, to follow this, this philosophy that exists in the Environmental Noise Directive uh, and to um, describe uh, how it should be done in the uh, aviation sector um, to uh, involve all those stakeholders uh, that I mentioned, so the, the operators, the, the community, um, and so on. Okay, thank you. Further questions? I don't see any raised hand. So thank you very much uh, for that. Thank you.